If the criminal justice system were apparent, we would call it abusive and neglectful. It punishes too much and not often enough. My name is Mark Kleiman. I'm professor of public policy in the UCA School of Public Affairs. I teach courses in methods of policy analysis and drug abuse and crime and edit the Journal of Drug Policy Analysis. I wrote When Brute Force Fails because I'm both excited and angry. Angry about uh, having much too much crime and an intolerable number of people behind bars. And excited because out in the field people are doing things that could change that. There are more people behind bars in the United States than in any other country in the world. We have more prisoners than China does. Not per capita, we have more prisoners than China does. With 5% of the world's population, we have 25% of the world's prisoners. Basically, we've got a criminal justice system that doesn't know what every competent parent knows. That you change people's behavior by giving them clear rules and by enforcing those rules consistently and quickly and fairly. The worst thing about our criminal justice system is it's randomized draconianism. Uh, we're very severe in the way we punish people, but we do so very irregularly, very erratically. The basic reform is to substitute swiftness and certainty for severity. The average probation violation leads to no punishment at all, but an occasional probation violation will lead to six months in prison. That's the best possible way to fill up your prisons and not change anybody's behavior. Typical probation department does drug testing and tells people that they're not supposed to use. And if a test comes back positive, the probation officer says, don't do that again. And the next time it happens, the probation officer says, don't do that again. And the third time the probation officer says, you know, if you keep doing this, you're going to get in trouble. And the fourth time he says, this is your last warning. And about the eighth or ninth or twelfth time, they're seeing the judge and the probationer might be off to prison for six months. Lunacy. He had no way of knowing that the last, last warning was really the last warning. If you've got a large number of violations and can't punish all of them, there are two approaches. You can punish more or less at random, in which case everybody learns that mostly he's gonna get away with it. Or you can pick some subset of offenders, of offenses, of locations, of times, pick some part of the universe and say, okay, here's the rule within that part of the universe. So concentrated enforcement means deciding what you're not gonna tolerate and who you're not gonna tolerate doing it, directly communicating that threat to the people who's behavior you want to change, and then carrying it out. If offenders were perfectly rational, crime control would be easy. Ratchet up the severity of the punishment to the point where even a small probability of being caught means it's not worth it. That's what we've been trying for the last 30 years, and it basically hasn't worked. Everybody is more sensitive to immediate consequences than to future consequences. Everybody is more sensitive to certain than to uncertain consequences. Offenders are probably more like that than the rest of us. They're more reckless, they're more impulsive. Therefore, it's even more important to move the consequences close in time to the offense and to have the link be highly probable. There's a trade-off between severity on the one hand and swiftness and certainty on the other. I mean, we've known for a long time that swiftness and certainty are more important than severity. What's not adequately understood is that severity is the enemy of swiftness and certainty. Severe punishment can't be swift because there's a lot of due process involved, and it can't be certain because you're chewing up a lot of resources. Right, so that 25-year mandatory sentence under the California Three Strikes Laws, that's 25 people who can't be locked up for a year. And it's a little strange that the people who are loudest about opposing wasteful government spending haven't noticed that long prison terms are wasteful government spending. I agree that vengeance is an important part of justice. The tone deafness of official criminology and the legal academy to the need for vengeance seems to me has contributed to the, to the problem. I mean, if you acknowledge the need for vengeance, then you can say, but it ought to be proportional. The resistance to using DNA testing uh, to find out whether somebody's guilty comes from the prosecutors, the cops, and the victims. Not all of them, but often enough. And the psychological mechanism is clear enough. Right from the victim's point of view, what matters is that somebody was punished for that crime to validate the victim. But it ought to matter a little bit whether it was the right person. 
Of course, higher incarceration to some extent must work because the people who are in prison aren't committing crimes on the outside. Now, if we counted the crime rate inside prison, the crime drop would not have been as dramatic. I was a strong advocate of building more prisons back when we had fewer than half a million prison cells. The first additional half million was well worth doing. The next million and a half, not so much. We may do with the fifth as many prisoners as we have now. Everybody else in the world does that. Um, we gotta figure out how to do that. As Pat Nolan says, right now we're imprisoning a lot of people we're mad at. We only ought to imprison people we're afraid of. There are three groups of people who ought to be in prison, and only three. There are people who do such appalling stuff, we want to make an example of them. So Bernie Madoff. People who are violent criminals and whose rate of crime is high enough, so it's just worth the 40,000 bucks a year to not have them in our hair. And then there are people who won't behave on the outside. Put them an ankle bracelet on, takes the ankle bracelet off, okay, he's picked himself for prison cell. Everybody else we can adequately punish and control in the community. The key thing about the American system is that we have police chiefs who are appointed by elected mayors and prosecutors, district attorneys, who are themselves elected officials. They are very sensitive to what the voters want. And what the voters have wanted ever since the crime boom of the 1960s is revenge on the criminals. In some ways, uh, I think the voters are right to say, hey, crime's a big problem, we should do something about it. Unfortunately, they were badly misled by their politicians into thinking that, that random uh, severity was a, good, was a good solution. We should be striving for having as little crime as possible with as little actual punishment as possible. We should do as much as we can to make threats do the work of actual punishments. This is Schelling's principle. The perfect threat is the one that never has to be carried out. <laughs>